This is Info Dan. Info Dan. Info Dan. Info Dan. Information necessary for understanding. Information necessary for understanding. Afro Latinos in America. Sambo and the roots of racism. This is Info Dan. Information necessary for understanding. Welcome back, folks. Just a recap of where we at right now. We cover the silent majority on how Afro Latinos as a single demographic is definitely majority in the Americas. And before we move on, I do want to give a shout out to one of our viewers. Derek Wiggins had a comment on our last episode. He says, this is a great presentation. I miss lectures like this. It reminds me of cultural history lessons in the 80s when there was more black Latino awareness. I wonder where has all this interest gone? Great question, Derek, as we know, there is a deep history, especially in New York City, in terms of Latino, Afro-Latino awareness. We know there was a culture of the young lords who were definitely prominent in the 70s, and that culture has carried on to the 80s. So there was always a camaraderie among the blacks and Latinos, especially in big cities, and New York City is definitely one of them, where there was a common struggle. And now for the topic at hand. Sambo and the Roots of Racism. It's called Black Americana. We thought that more than likely it wouldn't be an issue. The Franklin Shop says this was black and white people buying this stuff. Let there be no doubt about that. They're mocking us. Known for being fashion forward, today Prada faces accusations of being racially backward. Racism has no place in New York City. It's been an image uh, that's been promoted in the United States for a long time. And right now, since we're going through a time of racial inequality, racial tension in the United States currently right now, it's important to note that these images that were broadcasted, published, made movies of, and cartoons, this served heavily in the psyche of both white and black people. White people thought that this was accurate image and a portrayal of black people. And unfortunately, some black people were believing that for themselves. Let's see if we get some history or some information on Sambo and where this whole thing started. Old New York Times article titled An Icon Through History. Uh, let's see what this says. Throughout American history, many whites and even some blacks, including scientists and social scientists, have made the mistake of taking this figment of white imagination, this Sambo, as the real true to life Negro. So you can see this article is trying to put some clarification on Sambo and how it played a role in American history and its portrayal on black people and in the psyche of both black and white. But is there a connection between the Sambo and the Afro-Latino identity? We also know this image was used in Latin America and who knows what are the lasting damaging effects it had on the population of Latin America. But let's take it back to a time before the imagery, before the Sambo. Let's go back to a time of nobility. During the Moorish rule of Spain from 711 to 1492, this is a time period of great advancement in literature and arts. Uh, there were great structures made. Moorish Spain is known to usher in what we know as the Renaissance, the European Renaissance. It was the foundation of the Moors that gave way to what Europe is known today. And this would be something that should be portrayed in terms of talking about melanated people or even Afro-Latinos for that matter. This was a time where Moors and Jews represented the best of nobility in the world and specifically in Spain at that time. Spain always had a melanated population um, just by uh, geography alone. It's the crossroads between uh, Europeans and Africans and Middle Easterns. So it's expected to be a population of great mixed diversity, and especially at this time during the Moorish Empire. Many books were written on the subject. The scholars, those who are studied, those who take scholarship seriously, they all know about this time period, the history of Moors in Spain, and not just Muslims. There was a Sephardic Jew population of melanated people. Um, this is a history that's been greatly hidden during the time of Inquisition. Uh, 
their purpose was to kick out this population of people, uh, the Moors and the Jews of Spain. Amazing book, The Jews and Moors in Spain is actually written from a Jewish scholar's perspective back in the 1800s who done research on the topic, made a speech, a lecture, and this book is actually um, a recording of that lecture. Let's go into the book and see what it would say on this topic. It says here, uh, dispersion of the Jews. It says, ships stood ready in the harbors to carry nearly all the banished 300,000 Jews. With so ever it suited the captains. In these ships, the exiles were literally packed, crowded together without regard to sex or age. Often mother torn from child. Who does that sound like? When we hear stories of 300,000 people being kicked out of a land and shipped to another land, regardless of how crowded the conditions were on the boat, Regardless of sex or age, kids ripped from their mother's arms. Who does that sound like? I asked the question. We know 1492, the school textbook version of history tells us that Columbus came and discovered uh, what he later called the land of Hispaniola, uh, Little Spain. It's no wonder that the same year they're kicking out Moors and Jews melanated Moors and Jews from Spain that they are quote unquote discovering a new land and they are in need of a certain talent and workforce. early 1500s the new colonies were being filled by a huge free people of color population all the peak of knowledge in spain at the time was carried over to the new world these were the descendants and they were carrying on these special skills on and creating a new way of life here in the americas there were no other people who were creating better relationships with the native population whether it be uh, people of color who had wealth and land and take on wives and married an aboriginal woman or this black nobility that were finding themselves now having to fight those who brought them here were joining forces with the aboriginal community and they were forming these communities and many ideas and languages and knowledge were shared amongst natives and these free people of color many books were written on this phenomenon uh, you have william katz he put out a book called black indians Another great book that talks about the relationship between blacks and Indians is Africans and Native Americans, the language of race and the evolution of red black peoples by Jack D. Forbes. And let's read a passage from the book. Since many, but not all, Native Americans were brown or dark colored without African ancestry, many of their descendants, when mixed only with African blood, would very likely be seen as Negroes. But most Europeans, especially in North America, where special terms for such persons, such as Zambo, there goes that word Zambo, interesting. It describes a person who might be Native American, might be someone of African descent, someone who's of dark copper color. This population of people were indistinguishable either native american or african it, and it came to a point where uh these terms were just replaced by using the term mulatto it says here and mulatto changed its meaning uh meaning where a european might see a dark-skinned brother or sister and not sure if they are either african or native american uh this is where you get the term mulatto so a mulatto may not necessarily mean someone of mixed race it may seem someone who um not sure of where their race is from or not sure of their ancestry words like zambo 
and Mulatto were interchangeable and had similar meanings. Sambo, now, first meaning, meaning offensive, a black person. So let's go with the historical meaning. It says here, Sambo, historical, a person of mixed race. A person of mixed race, especially of black and Indian or black and European blood. But now, given the historical context, we see who they were making fun of. They were making fun of these unions between uh, people of color, uh, descendants of this nobility we spoke of earlier. We know who were being kicked out of Spain at the time of New World exploration. The Americas, for the most part, was dominated by this population of Zambos. We have 60 million Europeans coming into the country at this time, another 13 million going into Latin America. And by the time they coming into the country, the propaganda machine is already in full effect. Kids who are growing up who do not have a good grasp on American history, who may not fully understand the concept of the historical Sambo, um, you know, these are where ideas are now formulated and is a miseducation on people, whether you're black or white. Uh, what was going on in the country with Afro-Latinos? I mean, 1890. So as they're making fun at the Sambo character down in the Caribbean, uh, in the island of Haiti, uh, was celebrating an Afro-Latino president. And on the side of the Dominican Republic, was celebrating a Afro-Latino president, um, which is interesting. Simultaneously in the mainland United States, they're promoting the Sambo character. So where are these two brothers in the whole mix? Why are these images used to promote the greatness of melanated people in the Americas? In comes this brother here named Arturo Schomburg in the early 1900s, 1901, I believe and starts teaching Spanish in Harlem. Uh, There's a book written on Arturo Schoenberg. It says here, facing discrimination in his early years and being told that blacks had no history, Schoenberg made it his mission to research and raise awareness of extent contributions that afro lands and Afro-Americans have accomplished on their own throughout the years. His noteworthy for being an intellectual figure in the Harlem Renaissance movement, leading to political movements. He also was involved in the Negro Society for Historical Research, co-founded with Joe Edward Bruce, an institute created to support black literacy. He was the fifth and last president of the American Negro Academy organization founded in 1897. So, the brother was working on behalf on both Afro-Latinos and African-Americans. So we at the Amsterdam News, a, a well-known newspaper in Harlem, a historical newspaper. Uh, it says here, Schomburg's influence on African studies was profound as he impacted future generation of scholars. So he's influenced future generation of scholars. Let's see who are these future generation of scholars are says here, he opened up my eyes to the fact that I came from an old people. This is Dr. John Henry Clark saying this. And he goes on to say, older than slavery, older than people who oppressed us. Let's see who else Schomburg has influence. It says here that Dr. Ben said that the three of them would meet him, Schomburg, and Dr. Clark, we called scholar Dr. Georgina Fallu. They carried the responsibility of continuing to compile data, writing and publishing to continue teaching after Schomburg died. So it says here that after Schomburg had passed away that Dr. Ben and Dr. John Henry Clark would promise to continue his legacy of teaching. The master teachers, um, these two brothers, John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben, 
Um, they are known within the black community to raise the awareness and promote the greatness of black history. John Henry Clark being directly influenced by Arthur Schoenberg, who was an Afro-Latino. But do any of these brothers have any Afro-Latino ancestry within them? This brother right here, Dr. Joseph Ben, uh, known for his knowledge, his vast knowledge on Egyptology and the history of Egypt. At the age 97, this brother here, Dr. Joseph Ben, uh, passes away. Let's dip into a little bit of his ancestry. We here, this is a progressional record, number E2761. This could be found in the publishing office, uh, www.gpo.gov. This is a copy of a congressional record of a speech that Charles B. Rangel had made about Dr. Ben. It says here, uh, in 1918, Dr. Yosef A.A. Ben Yonikin officially known as Dr. Ben, was born in Gondor, Ethiopia, to Kristen Ben Yannikin, a lawyer and diplomat, and to Leah Mata, a native of Puerto Rico. It says here his dad is Ethiopian and his mom is from Puerto Rico. That's interesting. It says he was a homemaker and midwife. Dr. Ben's parents were both of Jewish faith. Both parents. So his dad was an Ethiopian Jew and his mom was a Puerto Rican Jew? Hmm, let's read further. His father was a member of the Falisha or Falasha or Beta Israel. And his mother was a descendant of Spanish Sephardic Jews. It says here his mother was a descendant of Spanish Sephardic Jews. Now this goes back into the information we was dealing with earlier. In terms of who was coming into this country as servants, as interpreters, as sailors, as guides, as middlemen, um, as soldiers, were the Moors and the Sephardic Jews. Let's read on. Kristen Ben and Talia met in Madrid, Spain, where she was attending college and he was working as a diplomat. It says here, soon after their marriage, they traveled from Spain to Ethiopia where their son Yosef was born. So their parents met in Spain, went to Ethiopia, and then that's where Dr. Ben was born. So that's an interesting background, and maybe not too many people knew that. It says here, Dr. Ben attended the University of Puerto Rico at Rio Piedras, where he first studied law, but later switched to civil engineering. Um, he graduated with a Bachelor's of Science degree in 1939. In his senior year of college, Dr. Ben wrote a self-published booklet titled Nosotros los Hebros Negros, We the Black Hebrews. Known for his Egyptology work and scholarship, but how many out there know that his first book was written in Spanish and it was titled Nosotros los Hebrews Negros, we the black Jews. Now this information correlates directly with what was spoken about earlier with the population of quote unquote free black people coming into the Americas. So not only this brother's an Afro-Latino, he's a, a Sephardic Jew ancestry. Let's keep it moving. Let's move on. Many books, paintings were made on this subject it's everywhere in terms of those who are seeking for it if you're looking for this information you'll definitely find it but the fact remains that there was a nobility in spain that the caucasian population looked up to at this time so what happened that it went from this adoration to enslavement to a submissive uh, subservient position of the Sambo. If we focus more on the historical context of what a Sambo is, maybe we can dispel what the offensive meaning of Sambo is. And I propose that we continue that legacy, but maybe dismantle the word Sambo and replace it with something else. 
the Spaniards first entered the Americas. They first called the inhabitants Indios. And people like to say, oh, this is an offensive term. But when Columbus first came into the Americas, he spoke highly of these Indios. He, he thought they were a godly people. In fact, when he spoke in his tongue, his Latin tongue, Indios can be translated to of God or God's people or godly people. In Dios. Dios means God in Spanish. En Dios. Hello. So why are we turning that into an offensive term? If the people first encountering them are considering them a godly people. So in my eyes, Indios is a great term. You just have to reclaim it. But I propose we use a word like Afro-Indios. With a meaning being Afro-Indios. The offspring and sacred union of Latino free people of color and the copper colored aboriginals of America. So let's turn this thing around. Uh, we've seen tons of slave movies. They keep feeding of movies of, of images of enslavement and lower class. But this story is more of a hijack and land grab than it is a story of slavery. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, this is the final part of the Afro Latinos in America. I will be discussing other topics. Um, please feel free to leave a comment. Peace to all. This is your brother, David Rodriguez, signing out for Info Den. Information necessary for overstanding. Peace.